Greetings viewers, welcome to my channel, and going to take a deeper look today on this Megaforce 6500 watt generator. So as you can see, I've done a lot of disassembly off camera with this generator already, and this generator is seen a pretty hard life, as I mentioned in another video. Uh, this used to belong to a construction company, and a, they basically threw it in the back of their warehouse when it stopped producing power. And it was actually ready to be thrown out, and one of the employees actually grabbed it and brought it to me to try and fix. And when I went through everything, essentially there, it needed a lot more work than what the generator was worth it to him. So he uh, let me keep it for parts pretty much. But I am going to make the attempt at rebuilding this generator. Uh, in another video, I did show that the exciter winding and the main windings are good on this generator. However, the voltage regulator and the system control board need to be rebuilt. And once that's done, then the generator head is pretty much good to go. Where a lot of the problems seem to be concentrated on is on the engine side, the prime mover. And the reason, I had a couple problems. One, the muffler was is pretty cor uh, corroded. And actually, I'm getting help from another fellow YouTuber on that. I'll go over that in a moment. But I just wanted to show you some of the things that I found. And the inside of this engine isn't that much better. But as you can see, somebody at one point tried taking this carburetor off. And it's a little bit harder to do because it goes through the recoil housing there. And the only way to get it off, the carburetor off, is to actually take apart the recoil housing. Not the best design, but that really is the only way to get it off. So they cut the linkage there. And this engine was overspeeding like crazy. And that was likely the reason why. So I'm going to have to replace that arm and also replace the linkage that is on the carburetor. Unfortunately, they do not sell that separately so I did buy a clone carburetor and we're just going to take the part that we need since this is an original carburetor and it seems to make the engine run just fine. Here we have the mufflers here on the bench and want to give a shout out to James Condon. Thank you so much for sending me this Briggs & Stratton storm responder muffler uh, he had in his uh, junk pile there and I'm going to be able to use this shield that's on here and transplant it onto the original muffler here. Unfortunately, I found this out only after I had gotten the muffler was that the muffler flanges are not exactly the same. This comes off more on an angle this way and it's curved. And then this one basically comes off at a 90 degree angle on the original GN360 engine. And it's also the same muffler that's on the GN410, which is on my Generac 7000 watt EXL here. Unfortunately, I won't be able to use the new muffler, but I can transplant the shield after I clean up the rust a little bit, and that should look pretty much good as new. And thank you again to James. Really appreciate the help on that one. You're the best. Here we are. It's a new day. I just put some high-temp Rust-Oleum paint on the original muffler here. We're just waiting for it to dry. And we're going to put this shield on after I clean it up a little bit. This is from the muffler that I got from James. Just put this old one on here for... Uh, so I don't lose it because I'm sure I'll be able to use the muffler still. Uh, for those that are interested, uh, the original part number was a 91158GS, which moved to a 1E5223A. And Generac still makes that part, but they want an arm and a leg for it. They want over $200 for it, which I think is ridiculous. The part number that uh, I got from James is here. Uh, it's a 189008GS, uh, they usually put GS at the end, and that's roughly about $130 with shipping. You know, a, li a little pricey, but more reasonable than over $200. I don't know why, but I believe it's just simply because it's an older model. Now that the muffler issue is solved, I'm going to work on the valve train here a little bit. I'm actually going to pull the head because in my discovery off camera, I use my inspection camera to look inside where the spark plug goes and I see a lot of burned oil. And what, what is happening with this engine is that this engine, when you first start it up after it's been sitting for a while cold, it will smoke like crazy, like it's smoking for bugs. It's really crazy. Uh, the reason for that is because the I'm guessing and most likely this is what happens with when you get those kinds of symptoms is that there are valve stem seals 
underneath the valve springs here that seal the valve and the stem from the combustion chamber. And what happens is that if, the, if those seals are worn and oil leaks past those seals into the combustion chamber, that's what is burning off. And it only smokes like that for a few minutes after you start it up and then it clears up. In addition, I'm also going to need to replace this breather hose. I don't know if you can see, but the end of it here wasn't inserted into the valve cover really well, and it actually has worn off and failed. That could uh, lead to a potential vacuum leak. We don't want that. So I'm going to have to replace that. And as I mentioned, I'm going to, I will have to pull the head. I know that from the leak down test that the valves are in good shape. I don't think that the valve guides are in bad shape at all given that there's only 71 hours on the hour meter for this engine i just think that those stem seals likely need to be replaced now i could avoid taking the head off by doing an old trick where you stick the rope into the spark plug hole there and then rotate the piston so that it's all the way up to hold the valves in place and then i can use my valve spring compressor to take off the springs and then change out the valve stem seals that way but seeing as that there's a lot of caked up in oil in there, it's a good thing that I'm just going to pull the head, clean it up, and we should be good. The leak down test did confirm that the valves are sealing properly. There's no adverse leakage on the, in, on the exhaust or intake. Uh, a little bit of blow-by into the, into the crankcase, which is normal. And I think if I had done it right, it was about 20 to 25% leakage. It's not, that's in the green, so I think we're okay there. But let's pull the head and see what we find. Got the cylinder head off. Wasn't too hard. Just one, two, three, and four bolts. And there's usually six bolts on some of these engines, but this, in this case, four. As you can see on the inside where the combustion chamber is, it's been burning oil for some time. And it's also been running very hot. And you can tell it's running hot by looking at the exhaust valve and you see all this white ash. It's definitely been running too hot here and I think it has a lot to do with the carburetor issue that I had discovered previously. Also the new muffler is ready to go. All the paint is dry and I put this shield on so it is ready to go. It probably still needs to dry a little bit more but that'll be ready to go on. And if you look inside here, I don't know how well you can see. Actually let me get a flashlight. So when it comes to worn valve guides and stem seals you will start to see some of the blow by and the compression going through those valve guides more so than if it were new this is your intake and then this is your exhaust and you can see the exhaust i don't think it actually has a stem seal we'll check that out in a moment in a moment but i know the stem seal on the intake side is going to need to be replaced so we're going to pop those off now and take a look Here's the top of the piston, and you can see where it's been burning quite a bit of oil. But if we rotate the engine, let's take a look at the sidewalls and see what condition those are in. And it looks like we're in pretty good shape because I can still see the original cross hatching. There's a good picture of it. I don't see any vertical scratches, which is a very good thing. So the block of the engine looks to still be in good shape. It just needs a very good cleanup. Let's take a look at that cylinder head. Just took out the exhaust valve. As you can see, it is definitely oily slick here. And that's likely where that puff of smoke was happening at startup. And I can see, I don't know how well I can see it here, but let's look at it this way. Doesn't look too bad. It was definitely running hot. I don't see any pitting, but we can clean that up, relap it in, and we should be good to go. And the same thing goes with the seat. Let's see if I can get a good picture of that. It is quite dirty from all the oil burning, but it looks like it can be saved. Let's take a look at the intake. Got the head taken apart and happy to report that the intake valve is in good shape. No abnormal wear or pitting. It does need to be clean, just like the exhaust valve. Just get a good look of it here. And then where it's been leaking oil has been through, it looks like the exhaust side. I don't know how well you guys can see that, but I'll take a good picture of it and post it through. And it should be right here. But the thing that was interesting was that the, the valve stem seal for the intake side looks to be in pretty good shape, but there was not one on the exhaust. Now, some engines don't. 
and it's more for oil control than anything. As you can see, the exhaust gases are popping out of the exhaust guide a little bit. Not too bad though. I think the stem seal should fix a lot of that there, and it will definitely stop the oil from dripping down here. Should at least give us better oil control. We're gonna get a new head gasket that should be in by tomorrow, and we'll start putting this back together and cleaned up. Here's a new day, and very nice day out. It's getting close to 60 degrees, probably the last one that we'll see for a little while here. It is December, so it will eventually get cold. But we have finished up the valve lapping here, and we've cleaned up the cylinder head here. And I'm happy to report that that went very well. As you, I don't know how well you can see on camera, but we can see here how the seat has cleaned up nicely. I'll try to go as easy as I can so it doesn't get all jumpy. But that's all nice and cleaned up. Also went ahead and cleaned up the top of the piston and cleaned up around where the combustion chamber meets the cylinder head and there's no ridge or anything like that. That's all cleaned up. And I also had a chance, since it is such a nice day, I power washed it. So there's no more kicked up oil anywhere and there was quite a bit on behind this recoil. I don't think it was leaking from the main seal there. I think it was just a bunch of sawdust and whatnot from the condensation it just built up. So I don't see any oil leaks. I think we're good to go on that front. We're gonna start reassembling the cylinder head. Just got the valves installed here. I'm gonna put on the valve springs. As you can see, I have put on a valve stem seal on both the intake and the exhaust where there was not one on the exhaust before. I don't think there's gonna be any problem with this. A lot of times they're not required, but I'm gonna put it on anyway. It ain't gonna hurt nothing. Got the head back on and doing a final leak down test with the flywheel lock so it stays in the top dead center on the compression stroke. And we are looking very, very good on the leak down. No leaking from either of the valves, so I did the valve job right. Let's continue on. So a quick word on adjusting the valve lash. I did have to readjust it because I had to take the head off. These need to be set between two and four thousandths of an inch on both the intake and exhaust according to the service manual. Keep in mind that you will need a very large Allen key to adjust the height of these rocker arms. Underneath here is an oddball size 13 millimeter nut. It is not a half inch. so. Make sure you have yourself an open-ended 13 millimeter wrench in order to do that. Also, these head bolts are torqued to 50 foot-pounds each, and it goes in the sequence of one, two, three, and four. What I did was I tightened it up uh, at 25 foot-pounds first in that sequence, and then did another round of tightening with the 50 foot-pounds to get it to where it needs to be. And here's the engine all put back together. I do apologize, I wasn't able to get that all on camera, but I wanted to note a few things that you need to look out for if you ever decide to take this machine apart. Over here is where you have, this is what the part that was missing. I just changed out the arm on the and put it on the original carburetor. In order to get this through, if you look at it, it goes through the recoil housing, and if you can see past there, it moves the governor arm. Now that I have the engine all squared away, I have to deal with the electrical side. There's quite a few issues going on here. I got a lot of loose connectors. Some of them are so hilariously loose. Some of these things, uh, these outlets actually may need to be replaced. But I did have to rebuild the system control board, specifically the voltage regulation circuit. And I also rebuilt the voltage regulator that goes in the end bell. 
Uh, in this case, the heat, uh, where this, this component on the heat sink is called the silicon controlled rectifier. That had to be replaced, and then there is a resistor uh, that needed to be fixed there that needed to be replaced. But the big diode was perfectly fine. This capacitor usually doesn't blow, and then this is an MOV or a metal oxide varistor. Basically, this uh, prevents any kind of spikes that are uh, voltage spikes that are on the circuit there, so that's more for protection. If this blows, then pretty much everything on here will blow out. The system control board actually has three circuits. You have your voltage regulation, as I mentioned, and those components usually uh, will burn very quickly because they're so small. The other two circuits are for your idle control, and then the third one is for your low oil control, the low oil sensor that is on the engine. The way the low idle circuit works is that when you turn it on here at this switch on the front panel, it turns on the circuit, it energizes it with 120 volts, it will then run through a bridge rectifier to convert it to DC, and then it will energize a solenoid that's on the governor arm here. If you can see it right there, straight ahead. There's your electric solenoid. That moves the governor arm to slow the engine's engine speed down when you, when you don't have a, a load on the generator. And then it's sensing it through your hot leads here. This is your current transformer and these two wires run back to the system control board. If it senses more than an amp on, of a load on your generator, it'll tell that circuit to shut off and turn off the solenoid so that the engine can run at full speed. Once the load is taken off the generator, if this switch is still on the panel, it'll re-energize that solenoid. It's a great fuel saving feature, but if you're gonna connect, uh, connect this generator to a house to a proper transfer switch, then that's not advisable just because a lot of your sensitive electronics in your house don't like that lower hertz and the lower voltage. So it may, things may not work, things might actually blow up. So don't do that. Finally, this, the third circuit is a low oil sensor and a low oil pressure sensor circuit. It's actually a time delay circuit and it's run by this pressure switch right here. It's actually normally closed, so it's always connected to ground when there's no pressure, and I believe it's set to eight PSI preset, and it's usually right next to the oil filter. And what it does is that the engine's not gonna have any pressure when it's off, so what that circuit's gonna do, it'll allow the engine to start, but if this switch doesn't have any pressure, it's gonna leave these wires connected to ground, it'll run to power the low oils circuit which is located on the system control board charging up the capacitor and if it gets to a point where that capacitor charges up it'll then turn on q4 which is that transistor and it will complete the circuit from these this, these yellow and the white wires to ground which will kill the ignition it's actually powered by the ignition coil it's not powered by the main windings or anything like that and what will happen is that this light will come on, but it flickers at the speed of the of the ignition. So that's what will happen, and the low oil will, will uh, light will turn on. So that's something to keep in mind. If your generator runs for 10 seconds and then shuts down, check first, check that you have enough oil in there, and that's very important. And two, if that is if it's got enough oil, pull this plug, and what it'll do is it'll disable that switch and the ignition switch here. If it do, if it continues to run then you know that that switch is bad. It's also possible that this switch could be bad too. I've seen them wear out too. But that's essentially how that circuit works. So it's a time delay, allows the engine, gives it a chance to build the pressure, but if it doesn't, then it will shut it down to prevent the engine from destroying itself. So I'm gonna go through all these wires right now, tighten them up, clean up any contacts. I will have to take off some of these Molex connectors and just recrimp them to get them a little bit tight because as you can see here, these are nice and tight at the hour meter. We're gonna go through that right now and that should be good to go. Oh, and one other thing I wanted to mention, this component back here. This is a, this is a 10 amp auto reset circuit breaker. And this is for the very uncommonly used DC battery charge uh, port right here. It uses a very, a unique, plug like two blades on an angle and then it goes to two alligator clips you can find them online but i highly doubt people actually use it i do have a set of those cables if you were like you know wanting to charge a battery bank or something like that but it's just an extra feature that i don't think many people use but in case anyone was wondering that's what that breaker that's what that device is for 
So the next step is after we've done the panel, I'm gonna install the voltage regulator. And this is how you connect it to the brush head. So the white wire is the positive and the black is the negative. And the way you can tell, you can really only put the brush assembly in one way. If I could try to focus on it, focus in on it, you'll see a little positive icon right there. The positive brush is the one that's closest to this end bearing right here. The one that's closer to the engine is your negative. I have the voltage regulator installed, at least for now, and what I'm going to do is just leave the voltage regulator connected to the brushes and then the exciter winding. Now the exciter winding is polarity sensitive, so blue wire is number two and red wire is number six. Number two has to be on the outside here. Otherwise, if you, you, if you flip these leads and you try to adjust your voltage, your voltage is not going to be adjusted uh, by the control board inside. It is polarity sensitive, so just know that you need to keep number two closest to the outside and number six closest to the inside of the board if you're looking at it from this direction. Now we're ready to go and start up the engine, let it run for a minute. It's probably going to burn off all that paint there and probably may smoke a tiny bit, but give it a chance to warm up and make sure that we actually have power. It's going to be high voltage, but once we do, then what we'll do is we're going to leave this three pin connector disabled. We're not going to connect it and we're gonna adjust the speed of the generator first. Always adjust the speed. Once I know the speed is correct, we'll shut it down. We'll reconnect this three pin connector and then it should start regulating voltage once we start it up. And then we're gonna to have to adjust the voltage here at that potentiometer. So that's what we're gonna do next. All right, we got the machine going. And we've adjusted the high speed right here. 61.4, 61.5 hertz is where you want it to be. And then when we turn on the idle control, you we'll adjust it right here, loosen this jam nut, and then you can use the square part of the, of the chuck to go and move it. Going in clockwise increases the low speed, counterclockwise decreases the low speed. And here's the slow speed, about 48 hertz is what you want. And then you turn the idle control off. Right where you need to be, no more than 62 hertz. But right now when you're at 62 hertz, you got 314 volts because we're running at full power. We'll have to shut it down and connect the system control board. And here we have the voltage set on one side, unloaded 124, 125 volts. About 249, 250, which is what you want. I've already buttoned up the generator head. So it looks like we have, I get this in there, right? 250 volts. There we go. 62 hertz. We may have to adjust that a little bit. Turn the idle control on. comes down it's like it's having a hard time reading it that's really about 48 Hertz might have something to do with the 30 waveform I can't seem to read on it right but suffice to say you're looking at about 48 Hertz bring it back up Comes up to 62 hertz, which is what you want. So that was a very good successful test. I got everything adjusted properly, 125 volts each leg, and 61.5 hertz no load. 
I did run into a small issue here that I'm going to have to fix before I go on to load test it. Uh, the carburetor started leaking from the bowl, which is either it's loose or there's something leaking from the, the seal there. So I'm just going to have to fix that. That's a minor issue. I also did a quick 1500 watt load test on each leg with the heat gun and did not see any adverse voltage drop, which is good. But I'll do that here in the next clip once I fix the carburetor issue. The muffler is actually no longer glowing cherry red, which I'm very happy to see. The, it usually would get very cherry red here and what the way that this muffler is designed it comes in the back down through the baffles through and then out so if it was getting cherry red here it was likely because of a valve issue uh, or just running lean somewhere in the intake there and I'll, I'll adjust the carburetor here in the next segment I'm still waiting on for this breather and it looks like it did pop off it is damaged, but it doesn't look like it uh, caused any adverse issues there. But I should get that part here in, a, in the next couple days or so. What we're going to do is we're going to fix that carburetor issue, and then we're going to load test it with a 5,000-watt heater. It's got a couple different settings. It's actually an electric garage heater. It can do 3,000, it can do 4,000, and then 5,000 watts. Now, this is rated at 6,500 watts but I think I'm gonna to have to find some other heaters to really load this up once I'm confident that all the carburetor issues are solved, but it looks like we're on the right track. Another good thing to mention is that I am not seeing any excessive blow-by anymore. That sponge inside was filled with oil before I had done the valve job, and that is also a very good sign that the engine is much healthier and it's really got some good compression when you pull the cord. So I'm just waiting for that new hose to come through. And then I also, more of a minor thing, I did have to order a new oil fill because some genius decided to break off the knob the, that you can usually twist it off with your fingers, but they must have broken it off with a pair of pliers or something. So another minor part to get that taken care of and hopefully we'll get that in the next few days. Another minor but very handy thing to have is I'm going to go and get a new gas cap. I can't tell from a glance what the level is unless I take this off. So this is about 15 bucks for a used one here. So that should be here in a few days as well. Okay, I've taken off the carburetor and here is the clone carb and here is the original Nikki carb. Turns out that it was leaking gas because there was some debris in the carb bowl from and from the tank most likely. I'll run that fuel through a little bit just to make sure that there's no more to come through. That's probably the reason why it was leaking gas. And the seat doesn't look too bad. I can't really focus in on it too well, but it doesn't look too bad. But I'm going to uh, change it out anyway. I can swap parts from the clone carb to the Nikki carb, which is good. I know that this carb is clean. It runs, it runs perfectly. It was just leaking a little bit. Now, the inside of this bowl is okay. It's got a little bit of corrosion, but it's not bad. But I think I'll change it out anyway since I have, this actually is a little bit heavier, but, uh, and it will fit. I think I might just use that actually. But other than that, there is a kit that you can buy for this uh, Nikki A4600. It's used on a lot of the GN engines from Generac. And it uh, is very expensive on its own if you were to buy it new. But the aftermarket carbs work fine. The rebuild kits are about $13 to $15. Incidentally enough, the clone carburetors are about the same price. I got this for about $15 US. Better off to buy a clone carb and take any parts off that you need. Another thing to keep in mind too is that the rebuild kit does not, does not include is this little rubber plug right here. This, if that is not in there, the engine's not going to run right at all. Now that rubber is designed to be submerged in gasoline. It's, it's resistive to that, but over time it does get hardened and will start to either uh, break apart or fall out and you may have to replace it. So I, years ago, I did find this part. It's somewhere on Smokestack. I don't remember what the part is, but I'll look for that uh, offline here and put it into a link here. But without even having to go that far, get yourself a clone carb and then you can rebuild your original if you had to. A quick minor note, the bowl on the clone carb will not fit on the Nikki. It's slightly taller than the original. It does feel a little bit heavier, but if you were to try to install it, what will happen is that it will not completely seal up against the bottom of the carburetor head there, and it will likely leak. So that was in my case here. 
I don't know if that would be in your case. It is a clone car, but just want to let you know, it probably could be modified if you wanted to flare out this section here a little bit so that it can go up against the seat a little better around the seal here. But again, I don't know if you might run into that. That's what I ran into. Thankfully, my bolt is still in good shape that I can reuse it. So that's what I'm gonna do. Here's the low test setup that I'm gonna use. I have a garage heater that can do three, four, and 5,000 watts. And we're gonna adjust it to make sure that the load is good. I'm also gonna be monitoring everything from the kilowatt meter. So let's start her up and here we go. All right, we got it running. 123 volts on one leg and we'll check it on the other one just to make sure that they're equal and 61 Hertz so here's 3,000 watts load it up went from 123 volts to 118, 119 volts. So that's a good voltage drop. Nothing abnormal. Let's try the other side. The other winding. And that's equal as well. So now let's do 4,000 watts.
got this running at 4,000 watts, but unfortunately it keeps tripping here. It looks like that circuit breaker is worn out. I'm going to have to replace it. But the good thing is, it does idle down with the idle control on the 48 hertz. I've taken apart the panel here so we can get a look inside and what we're going to do is we're going to replace these two 30 amp breakers and the way that these are wired inside the generator for this particular model you have your L1430 right here you have an L530 which is just 120 volts and then you have your duplex outlet which is a GFCI the way that this is wired so these have the two hot wires 11 and 44 so here's 11 and here's 44 and what these basically do is that on the line side and then you have the load side so the line side is where they're coming off the stator and then you have the load side where it's going to the outlet so these two actually operate the twist lock because you have two of the half windings running the l1430 this breaker only operates the l530 and then here on the on the load side it'll jumper over to here which is a 20 amp breaker and this being a gfi it will actually power both the top and the bottom on my other generator it's actually two 20 amps where one 20 amp goes here and then another 20 amp goes here that is not what this generator is set up for so these are push to reset thermal breakers and the thing with these breakers is that they do eventually wear out it's basically a thick piece of metal that goes from point to point inside and then if it gets hot enough the metal will deform and disconnect breaking the circuit and then when it, you have to actually push the button in order to reset it and over time that piece of metal will wear out and trip prematurely and that is what's happening in the last segment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace them with this part number. Now this part number you can this is not the exact part number but i know it'll work probably the reason for this part number is a little different because it has a 30 amp logo on it but it's set up this way we're gonna have to install them this way so the 30 amp is going to be on the side no big deal i believe this one's okay because i don't believe this uh gfi was used very often it looks like this on the construction site they had probably a breakout box connected to the l1430 also, in my testing and running with the load of uh, 5,000 watts, 3,000 watts, 4,000 watts, this hour meter was not moving. It's still showing 71 hours or 71 and a half hours, and it was not moving. The way that this particular hour meter works, I don't believe you can get it from Generac or Briggs & Stratton anymore. It's actually running off the battery charge windings. It runs over inside here to the auto reset circuit breaker off of the battery charge windings through a rectifier so dc voltage is coming into the dc volt plug here and then also powering this so I'm, what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this out and just connect it to a battery and see if it actually moves because i have been running this for about a half an hour 40 minutes uh during my testing here and if it's not moving well not much i can do it's not moving i could try to take it apart but uh let's see if it's uh powering because i know that i'm getting about a 12 volts, 14 volts on the DC outlet here. So if this is definitely receiving power, but let's check that out. Here's the new 30 amp breakers installed. Now what you will likely run into is that these spade connectors will get a little stretched out as you try to pull them off. And that's just unavoidable unless you recrimp new ends on there. What you do is you take some needle nose pliers and you just kind of crimp them a little bit closer together. So make sure that when you put it back onto the new circuit breaker that it's nice and tight and if it still wiggles a little bit i usually will put these small uh, zip ties on here and then really tighten them down as best you can that way it makes a good solid connection on one of these this breaker was here and as you can see on the load side it was starting to get hot and possibly arcing there and it's a good thing that we're changing them out unfortunately i don't have a spare 20 amp breaker lying around but i don't think that this is too much of an issue uh, if i do have to replace it i'll replace it in my testing but with the gfi uh, outlet here i don't think it was used very often there's a lot more wear on these two plugs here i'm doing a quick test on the hour meter here i just have some alligator clips connected to my jumper pack we're running that right now and it's showing 71 and a half hours 
and what I'm gonna do is just, I have it plugged in right now, let's see if it actually does anything. My guess is that when the, it looks like I'll have to glue that little piece there, but it looks like that when the electrical end shorted out, it also took out that. Unfortunately, I don't believe this part is available anymore. Unfortunately, this has been sitting for a few minutes and the hour meter is not moving, so I'm pretty sure that this is dead. But the good thing is, even though Briggs no longer carries it, it is a very common hour meter that you can get. So I found one off Amazon for about $13. That's going to be here in a few days. And then I'm going to show you guys a very creative solution on how to get these meters to show, because the new meter is going to show zero hours. We want it to be, I'm going to call it 72 hours, because I have been testing with the generator for about, I don't know, it's been run, it runs for about 30, 45 minutes so far. But that way I can get the new hour meter back to where the old one was, where it likely failed and it hasn't been used ever since. And we'll get that reinstalled back in the generator. Here we are upstairs and we have the new quartz meter. Now it shows zero hours. And what we're going to need to do is get it to show 72 hours, which is where the old one left off. That's no longer functioning. And the simplest way to do it is to power it with a power source. In this case, we have a simple 12 volt power supply. And what we'll do is we'll connect this barrel tip up to, in such a fashion to where I can get power to the leads here. And it is polarity sensitive. Normally I would just set an alert on my phone. Okay, you know, alarm goes off at 71 hours. So I know to come upstairs and disconnect it. Uh, there is another more uh, creative solution that I'm gonna try this time and it is a delay relay module where you can actually program the relay to turn on for the, a specified amount of time and shut off after that time period is done. That way I don't have to worry about running back upstairs to unplug it. All right, we replaced the 30 amp breakers and we are looking at side of the winding. This is with a 3,000 watt load. Let's go to 4,000. That's good. No abnormal voltage drop. And finally 5,000 watts. watt low test each side of the windings is balanced and we're about 59 Hertz so now we're gonna go to 4,000 and then 3,000 and when you shut it off Should idle down. Currently has 71 hours, probably be about 72 hours when I load this. Well, that's a wrap on this generator. It's certainly been a good project to go through and get all the pieces fixed. And I also was able to finally get the gas cap with the gauge in there. The new breather hose came in and that's all taken care of. So that's not popping off anymore. I also got the oil plug here. Now I can actually get my fingers around it instead of using a pair of pliers. And the hour meter, I got the new one in there. And now it shows about uh, 72 hours, just like I wanted. And we have the two new circuit breakers. Certainly ready for the next power outage. And... Thank you everyone for watching. If there's any questions, please leave a comment below. I'll do my best to answer them. And on to the next project, which happens to be a very large inverter generator. But that's for another video.
Thanks for watching.